In practice, when you're doing max-min problems, you're going to follow the same method. You find the critical points, you classify them, and then you're done. But there's something that you need to remember. You should have heard this one before. This should be in the back of your head. This is so important. You have got to check the endpoints. If you're trying to optimize a function over some domain, you always have to check the endpoints. Always check the endpoints because they too are critical. They are part of the critical point set. Remember our definition of critical points? Remember how we said it's where the derivative is zero or undefined. And if you have an interval with some endpoints, those endpoints are places where technically the derivative does not exist because you have to compute the derivative by a limit, a two-sided limit. And if you can only access it from one side, technically derivative doesn't really exist there. It's still a critical point. Here's an example of what I mean. Let's say that we need to find and classify the extrema of a function that we've seen before. f of x is x to the fourth minus 8x squared minus 5. But now we need to classify these critical points over the domain as x is between negative 1 and positive 3. That's going to be the difference in this case. Now we've already done this problem. We've already computed the derivative to be 4x cubed minus 16x, which factors as 4x times x plus 2 times x minus 2. If you set that equal to 0, then what have we got? How many critical points do we have? Well, there's actually four critical points now, not three like before. We still have critical points at x equals 0 and x equals 2 that are within this domain. Negative 2, mm -mm, no longer there. We can compute the second derivative, which we did previously, and evaluate it at these two interior critical points to determine that x equals 0 is a maximum. x equals 2 is a minimum, just like before. But now, what's different in this case is that we have endpoints, two endpoints, at x equals negative 1 and x equals positive 3. Now, classifying those is going to be a little bit more involved. We have to think a little bit more deeply in terms of what is happening here. The first derivative limits nicely to these two endpoints. The second derivative limits nicely to these two endpoints because there's nothing degenerate happening. Then we're going to have an alternation between maxima and minima. And as we go from smaller to larger critical points, as we go from x equals negative 1 to x equals 0 to x equals 2 to x equals 3, we're going to alternate between maxima and minima. Because we know that x equals 0 is a maximum, x equals 2 is a minimum, we can infer that x equals negative 1 is a minimum and x equals positive 3 is a maximum. This can be checked by plugging in the values into the original function f. At x equals 1, we get, let's see, 1 minus 8 minus 5. That's negative 12. When x equals 0, we get negative 5, clearly. When x equals 2, we get 16 minus 32 minus 5. That is negative 21. And then when x equals 3, we get, oh boy, uh, 81 minus 72 minus 5. That's positive 4. So now we can see the difference between local maxima and minima and global maxima and minima. At x equals negative 1, what we really have is a local minimum because there is a global minimum at x equals 2. That value of negative 21 dominates. The maximum at x equals 0 is a local maximum at negative 5, as opposed to the global maximum at x equals 3. And all of this matches what we see when we graph the function out. It's almost always a good idea to pay attention to local versus global when you're trying to find maxima and minima. But doing so really requires considering the endpoints, considering the global picture. 
Now keep in mind that sometimes you can have an endpoint at plus infinity or minus infinity. If your domain is unbounded, then you have to consider those limits as endpoints, as critical points as well. So be especially careful of that when you're looking at local versus global optima.